Oh, yeah. All right. It's now nighttime. Forgive the blanket. The blanket is not present for the rest, okay? The blanket is our special guest. My mom got it for me because I said I'm a cat person, so she bought me a blanket with cats on it. <laughs> so, a while ago, I made the internet pretty angry. Maybe you saw this TikTok. I was supposed to excuse this to follow his leadership. Or this TikTok. Taught you to hate the texture of your hair. It's the same people that taught Malcolm X to hate his queerness. I'm not here to take any of it back. I am here to provide the resource that I said that I did ages ago because I did record a video essay and then my TikTok made it to like, at first it was like at 200, 300,000 views. So I was like, oh good, there's engagement. And then once we got into the five, six range, I got a lot of hate comments. And I said, ooh, you know what I like? Peace, ease, comfort. You know what I don't need? YouTube comments, nonetheless. I am here anyways because I then found out extra facts about Malcolm X for all the people that said, you didn't do your help, write the damn book. Okay, I'm learned now. You wanna know what I found out? A lot of shit. And I said, I wanna talk about this shit on the internet, but it is not worth my piece. So what I will do is make a resource for an engaged audience. That's what I'm trying to do here. Make a resource for an engaged audience. I will not take hate comments unnecessarily. Now there's an introduction to this video essay that I'm going to get into because I want you to know who I am and what politic I am reading this book with. That's really, really relevant to the rest of the way that I read the book. I would caution you to not skip the introduction, but if you want to hear me just get straight into the meat of things, here's the timestamp, go crazy. I do think that it is important as critical media consumers to know who you're talking to and to know who's talking to you. I want to encourage myself as well as anybody watching me to be a critical consumer of media. And that includes the media that I make. You should be questioning, why do they say this? What do they mean by that? What politic are they coming from? I lay that out for you in the introduction. It is relevant to the reading of the text, the reading that I give. But if you wanna skip it, skip it. I'm just saying it's there. And it's especially important as we discuss some more sensitive topics about Malcolm X and his life and history, especially the ones that were not present in this book. I cannot stress enough that I am not here to debate whether Malcolm X is gay or not. I think debating somebody's sexuality on the internet is in the best case, unnecessary, and in worst cases, dehumanizing. So that's really not what we're supposed to do here. Or that's, that's not the kind of conversation that I'm trying to have here. What I'm trying to say is, if queerness is present, how does that change the way that we read the text? And what does Malcolm X maybe being queer say about the ways in which we're willing to negotiate black masculinity, who is allowed to be queer and what is slanderous? To both expand on the politic that I am coming from and to take a critical look at what's missing from this text. We'll get to the other three in just a second. I present two texts. The first one is the Kambahi River Collective Statement from 1977. And the second one is a chapter from a Bell Hooks book called Writing Beyond Race. Let's get started. Hey, grab your tea. I'm having to try to get Back to business, bitch, you know in that pinky up I get ignorant. I'm only pawing up with the folks I'm stacking my figures with. Salute that, the vibe's right. I'm bringing that group back. Spilling tea on timelines like messy bitches in group checks. Yo nigga couldn't fuck with my fly. I'm high as a goose back. Can't fuck with no niggas. from a book is so sexy. I love having a hard copy of things, but I'm trying to watch my consumption. So sometimes I have eBooks. You're gonna have to forgive my laptop, okay? Now you'll notice on YouTube that I use different language, like allegedly and could have been that I didn't use on TikTok. That's correct. I said what I said. TikTok is the place for my opinions, as well as Patreon is the place for my opinions. If you would like to know more about what I think about this particular subject. Here, I am trying to make a resource, meaning I am trying to keep it as conjecture-free as possible, okay? So I didn't switch up, I'm doing a different thing. Let's get into it. The personal is political. We're gonna take some notes from the Kambahi River Collective. Kambahi River Collective was a socialist, lesbian, black feminist organization that was active in Boston from 1974 to like 1980. The Kambahi River Collective waffled for a lot of years deciding what they wanted to do, how they wanted to show up, what was organizing, what was just emotional support for one another. Both are necessary. They really wanted to be a force though in the Boston community, in the greater black feminist community. They ended up writing one of the most seminal texts of black feminism to date. They ended up having 
retreats where they would teach on black feminism and those reached thousands but this statement has reached millions by now and continues to reach millions this statement right here is one of the theses of my person my work my politics so going through it will tell you a lot about my politic and what i'm coming from because i believe in this statement i believe in these sentiments <sighs> and i'm bringing them up to say there's a reason why I think it's relevant to include the asterisks that Malcolm X could have been queer or could have been a queer sex worker. There are two paragraphs I want to look at from the Kampahi River Collective Statement. I'm going to read them both. We believe that sexual politics under patriarchy is as pervasive in Black women's lives as are the politics of class and race. We also find it difficult to separate race from class, from sex oppression, because in our lives, they are most often experienced simultaneously. We know that there is such a thing as racial sexual oppression, which is neither solely racial nor solely sexual, like, pause for trigger warning, the history of rape of black women by white men as a weapon of political repression. Although we are feminists and lesbians, we feel solidarity with progressive black men and do not advocate for the fractionalization that white women who are separatists demand. Our situation as black people necessitates that we have solidarity around the fact of race, which white women of course do not need to have with white men unless it is in their negative solidarity as racial oppressors. We struggle together with black men against racism while struggling with black men about sexism. Let's do a quick close read. Close me just means that I'm going to be looking at particular phrases, reinterpreting them or putting them in different words to expand upon my point. And it looks often at like the language used, the syntax, if we really had time to get into it. I don't want to spend too much time on outside texts on what is a video essay ultimately about this text. So all those super, super close reads, like look at the word choice used here for this, but just to give it a, a quick run over. Believing the sexual politics under patriarchy is as pervasive in black women's lives as the politics of race and class is something I absolutely stand on. Uh, in other words, this means that class and your social status, your social, your socioeconomic status affects every facet of life, every single one. It affects where you grow up, who you talk to, what resources you have access to. It affects your politics, like it affects all of that. And so does your race. And we can understand that the experience of a homeless black person is really different than the experience of Beyonce, a very rich black person. I shouldn't say Beyonce, the Beyonce stands are gonna come for me. Come for me then. Yes, it's a critique. I digress, that is a different, it's a different video essay. It is Ismatu, it is a different video essay. They also want to include gender. Gender, race, and class are these three big things that dictate every facet of life and all three of these things are highly politicized i am not a black person one day and then a poor person the next day and then a woman or someone who is perceived to be a woman the next day all of those things happen concurrently they happen at the same time it's one of the theses of their work now later this is referred to as intersectionality that's a term coined by kimberly crenshaw but kimberly crenshaw didn't make it up the Kambahi River Collective didn't make it up. These are the people that communicated to us. This is the theory of interlocking oppression. It stacks on one another. You experience all these things simultaneously. They weigh on you all at once. So with that being said, that they can say soundly, we know there's no such thing as racial sexual oppression, which is solely racial or solely sexual when you're both. They're happening at the same time, all the time. You're getting hit on more than one front all the time and for that they look at the history of the history of assault i'm gonna stay away from the r word but we know what i'm trying to say of black women by white men as a weapon of political repression the reason that black men and black masculinity is very hostile to the idea of queerness to the presence of queerness to the presence of deviating in any way from the beautiful arc of heterosexuality and heteronormativity uh, is because Black men have a similar history in the United States. I'm going to cite my sources in case you did not know that, but Black men were also assaulted by white men as a weapon of political repression a lot. It is one of the reasons for the deep homophobia. I don't even mean just hatred, sincere fear 
that we have in the black community, particularly in the black masculine community. And it's one of the reasons why uh, talking about Malcolm X's potential queerness, potential queer sex work is so charged, I'll say. I'll get into this a little bit more in the Bell Hooks reading afterwards, but I wanna say that I'm not bringing up the potential for Malcolm X to be queer as a way to slander him or to discredit him. There's nothing discrediting about being queer. I'm bringing this up to say the personal is political. If you have identities that you're not allowed to name out loud, if you have identities, particularly in the big race, class, gender, and for this, we're talking about gender and sexuality kind of in tandem here. If one of the, these three identities are really, really politicized in the United States, imagine not having access to one, having internal guilt, shame, or struggle about one, having to hide an entire history there that's a part of your life. Again, we're talking about this and I'm bringing it up because it's absent. One of the questions that you ask when you critically engage a text is what's missing? That's missing from this text. And if I didn't know that that was a thing that would be missing, I would read this text really differently. In fact, I had to re-record this because when I found this out and read it again, I read it differently. I see the misogyny a little bit differently if I understand that it might be coming from a place of internalized homophobia. That's a really different and nuanced conversation than enjoying the privilege and flexing the privilege of maleness in a patriarchal society. Is it not? It is. The personal is political. That's why I brought this up. The statement goes on to say, although we are feminists, although we are lesbians, we feel solidarity with progressive black men and do not advocate for the fractionalization that white women who are separatists demand. Remember, the white feminist movement was really separatist at the time. They were saying, get rid of men. We don't need men. We're just going to separate from you entirely and do our own thing. We're going to leave you in the mess that you made. And our situation as Black people is different. Our situation as Black people necessitates that we have solidarity around the fact of race, which of course, white people don't have unless white people don't have amongst their own gender dynamics, unless it's in their negative solidarity as racial oppressors. That's just history. So they're saying we struggle together with black men on racism and you struggle with black men about sexism. I wanna talk about the bar for liberation. Uh, I said that there were two paragraphs, but there's really three. There's one more that I wanna read because it exactly describes my politic. It's for the, but he changed argument because how much did he change? Let me explain to you what the bar is to make sure that your ideas for liberation and my ideas for liberation are tandem. This focusing on our own oppression is embodied in the concept of identity politics. I'm not gonna read this word for word, I am gonna put it on the screen, but it essentially says that the most radical politics don't come directly out of one's own identity, as opposed to working to end somebody else's oppression. I'm fighting for my people because I am my people. This is the idea that the people whose liberation that we are fighting for the most are the people at the very, very bottom, under the most pressure, at the most intersections. My fight in particular is with my folks, the people that are my peers, the people that share my identity. That's where I can do the most work from. So I am going to be reading this book from a race perspective, from a class perspective, and from a gender perspective. This part, I do wanna read out loud. We reject pedestals, queenhood, and walking 10 paces behind. To be recognized as human, levelly human, is enough. That's the bar for me. That's my politic. That's what I'm here to represent. That's something that you need to know. And just a quick note, while, while we're on the subject, let's be really clear about what the divider is here. It is misogyny. When the Kambahi River Collective says that we need to be standing in solidarity with all black people that have the same idea for liberation, progressive black men, we're not leaving them behind, okay? Because it's all important that we all get out. I am not the dividing force here for naming misogyny. Misogynists are the dividing force for creating communities, economic systems, family structures that are hostile to me. I am not divisive for calling out misogyny. The divisive thing present here is the misogyny. So for the litany 
of people that accused me of being an agent of the FBI or the CIA kiss my ass. Yeah, I'm no, I'm gonna leave that in. You can kiss my ass. Further, I know that there's a huge temptation to be like, men suck, we should indeed just leave them to suffer. And as much as I would like to say, yes, bitch, you are right, I have to caution us. I do. I do have to caution us because black radical feminist tradition recognizes that we do not gain anything by being separates, separatists. We really do not. We gain when we are in community with one another. We do. There's no reason that we all can't make it out of this. If you're trying to make it out and to make it out means to make it out of everything, okay? I'm not talking about protecting the men that are protecting the patriarchy. If you are making your bed with the patriarchy, that is not a place I will be. You do that. But to the people that are struggling for liberation of all peoples, it doesn't help to leave anybody behind. And sure, there's a question of black men are perpetrators of harm within our community. That's absolutely true. Black men have been perpetrators of harm to me specifically. True, in general, and also me in particular. But I don't think that conversations around punishment are radical. I'm not even saying that they don't need to happen. I do think that we should have conversations about the, the will to punish, the want to punish, deservedness. Those conversations are necessary, they're important. I am not trying to say don't have them. I'm saying that this conversation is less about what we deserve and more about what do we owe one another? We who have suffered uniquely together in these awful circumstances, what do we owe one another? To what, what, what kindness, what comfort, what intimacy, what vulnerability, what space for learning and what space for teaching and the uncomfortability of exchanging ideas, that intimacy, what do we owe one another? How much can I give you? It's not how much do you deserve, it's how much can I give you? And it's not how much can I atone for? I mean, it is not, but for this context, it's gonna be how much can you give me back? How much can we learn from one another? How much do we need to put down? If it does not benefit me to leave you to suffer, and it does not benefit you for you to keep me here under patriarchy, how do we get out? What do we owe one another? That is the conversation that I'm trying to have here. And conversation, it's an exchange. I encourage you to talk to me back. If you feel like I am worthy of critique, tell me so. If you have sources that you want me to look at, tell me. I want to read with you. This is what I am reading for, okay? I'm reading for gender, class, and race analysis. And in short, the personal is political. Of course, queerness is central to how I engage with the text and to pretend like it's not is way more diminishing of Malcolm X's legacy than ex excluding it ever would be. The next part of this essay is from Bell Hooks and the lighting is gonna change magic. Let's finish up this introduction because I really wanna get into the text. There's just one more thing I need to say. Oh no, I spilled my tea. I, I wanna go ahead and at the top of the video address like how true can we take the claims, whatever claims there may be about Malcolm X being queer in the first place, isn't a lot of that contested or conjecture. To answer that question, I would like to read some critiques and discuss them. Bell Hooks has a really incredible book called Writing Beyond Race, uh, and she, chapter six, looks at the reinvention of Malcolm X, the reimagining of Malcolm X in these, autobi in, in these biographical works outside of his autobiography. Uh, so she talks about reading the biography and the effect that that had on her and then talks about the recent biographies that had came out they were recent for the time marables came out in 2011. obviously i read more than this one but most of the critiques that i found are either skeptical of the people marable or perry interviewed um skeptical of their ability to stick to the facts or they might agree with the claims made but disagree with the conjecture that's around them and the second one i agree with both of them read really slandery expose uh, extra extra read all about Malcolm X's secret life. That's ugly. I don't want to do that. I think the critiques from Bell Hooks sum up pretty nicely the dissenting side, so I wanted to read them together. Now is the time to remind everybody that I'm not set out to prove anything about Malcolm X's sexuality, especially not for the purpose of this resource. I want this to be a resource to read the book well, like a spark notes if you will. We talked about this. Let's do a quick close read. We're gonna see what Bell Hooks has to say. So conservative critics, white and black, who dwell on Malcolm X's sexuality aim to depoliticize him by slyly suggesting that he was just another brother on the down low, i.e. posing as straight, screwing females to cover up his homosexual appetite. Since much African-American youth-based pop culture mirrors the homophobic values of this imperialist, white supremacist, capitalistic, 
patriarchal society to inform this group that their shining black prince was really a queen in disguise is a character assassination aimed at both promoting homophobia while simultaneously encouraging this group to denounce Malcolm X to no longer see him as a champion of black manhood, but as an enemy. If this is accomplished, Malcolm X's life and experience will no longer serve as the catalyst for youth of all ages and all colors to come to critical consciousness and radical politicization. So sentence by sentence, uh, conservative critics, conservative is a key word here, right? White and black who dwell on Malcolm X's sexuality, the aim there is to depoliticize him by suggesting that he was like a closeted gay man. Uh, that's not what I'm trying to do here. Again, this isn't a debate about what Malcolm X's sexuality is. It's also an attempt to add a layer of nuance to his analysis. It's not an attempt to defang his politic, but it's an attempt to give him more claws, more tools, in fact. Since when does carrying a marginalized identity not make you more political? And then she goes on to say much of Black youth-based pop culture mirrors the homophobic values that are set by this wonderful nation. So to inform this group that one of their giants, one of their legends, one of their civil rights leaders is actually gay, which would be perceived as a bad thing, that's supposed to be a character assassination, right? It's, su it's supposed to encourage that target group of people to denounce Malcolm X because he's gay. That's supposed to discredit him. And if this is accomplished, then Malcolm X's life and his legacy, which for all intents and purposes is great, and there's a lot to learn from here, would be like thrown out like a baby with the bathwater. It would stop them from being able to come to a critical consciousness from a radical politicization. I have more faith in us of today. I have more faith in the teens of today. I have more faith in the adolescents. I have more faith in the adults that realize that they've been screwed over with their political education and are trying to start afresh. I have more faith in us. I hesitate, I really do. I hesitate to believe that us knowing or engaging critically with the knowledge um, of his complex expressions of sex would disqualify him as a catalyst for leadership. I don't want to talk about the possibility of Malcolm X's queerness in order to defame or debase him. Um, and I don't think that talking about his possible deviancy from heteronormativity is a reason to say, yeah, he's not a good civil rights leader. That doesn't make any sense. If anything, it means that there's even more analysis, more politic, more internal grappling than I realized. That's why it's important to talk about what is potentially missing. This changes the way that I read the text. Moving on. Of course, no writer who has ever fixated on Malcolm X's sexuality has theorized what it would mean both in our understanding of his life and leadership had he been a homosexual. Certainly, the profound sexism and misogyny expressed through much of his adult life is much more typical of patriarchal heterosexual learned behavior. Had Malcolm chosen to claim a gay identity, it would have no doubt aided him in transforming his attitudes towards the female gender. And while it is sensational and provocative to imagine Malcolm X morphing from shining black prince into fierce, fabulous queendom, the facts merely document conflicted sexual practices. Okay, first of all, bell hooks. I feel like you could have been the writer to talk about Malcolm X's sexuality and how it could have been theorized. You're one of the smartest people that I've ever gotten the space to encounter, even if it's only in the intimacy of the stuff that you wrote for us. Why weren't you the critic? Why weren't you the writer that theorized on what his uh, conflicted sexual practices that you admit are documented could have meant on his life and leadership? Why didn't you be the one to say, you know what? I'm, I'm wondering, or maybe did she and I missed it? Have I missed this somewhere? Please send this resource to me if I missed this from somewhere, because you're right, we should be talking about it this way. That's what I'm trying to do here. And she notes that the profound sexism and the profound misogyny expressed over the course of his life, not just pre-prison, could have been in effect with internalized homophobia, queerness that was kept up or kept secret. We don't know because he didn't tell us, but that's an important thing to consider as we read this book because there is a lot of sexism. There is a lot of misogyny. Yes, I read that differently if I know that this person might have been internalizing homophobia. Of course, that's a different radical analysis. And then Loki, this morphing from Shining Black Prince to Fierce, fierce Fabulous Queendom, I feel like is just a rough representation. Now, I know that she's talking about the critics of the time um, and she's saying that that's what they were trying to do, morph him from one to the other. But I'm saying it is also possible to talk about Malcolm X's queerness and understand that doesn't change a lot about his 
public or potentially even his private personas. The idea that uh, a change in his sexuality or a change in what we perceive, right? Because he was who he was regardless of what we understand. The idea that that would change his personhood I don't think that she's making that claim. I think that she's saying the critics around her are making this claim and that's an ugly one. I also think that is rooted in homophobia. Why can't you be a homosexual shining black prince or a questioning shining black prince or a queer sex working shining black prince? Why is that a one-way track to fierce fabulous queendom? Not that there's anything wrong with queendom, but that's not th those aren't adjectives in which I would use to describe Malcolm X. It's a false attribution on the persona, on the, even the public character of Malcolm X. And I think that it's one done to debase. And I don't like, we're not trying to debase anybody on the means of sexuality. You can't be debased because of who you like, have sex with, or have romantic feelings for. Yeah, and then she says, the facts document conflicted sexual practices. I think that they do too. Um, and again, I will get into them in a different resource. I really wanna make this video pretty heavily focused on uh, just the autobiography of Malcolm X and what he has to say about himself. But I do get into those on Patreon if you want to look. Okay, so bring it in. Oh shit. Oh my God. Really like the crux of all this is, I'm gonna talk about this text with the knowledge that this author may have been queer or may have engaged in deviancy from the arc of heterosexuality and heteronormativity. And adding that to the legacy of Malcolm X is not a character assassination. To claim so is to claim that queerness and sexual orientation, queerness and sex work, sex work in general is defaming or illegitimizing or otherwise bad. I don't think any of those things are bad. We should be able to talk about civil rights leaders in their fullness. And also what is so bad about sex work? What's so bad about queer sex work? Would it be so bad if he preferred queer sex work to other hustles available to him? Would it be so bad if he wore queer? Would that be so bad? Why do we leap through all these hoops of surely he was straight, surely he was straight. What about queerness is so slandering? What about queerness is such a bad thing? We have a lot of people reading these texts in an attempt to absolve Malcolm X from any unsavory claims. Bring it in. I want to make sure we understand that this author could have been queer or could have engaged in some deviancy from the beautiful arc of heteronormativity because it changes the way that I read the text. And also to say that being queer, engaging in queer sex work, whatever it may be, is not slanderous. There's nothing wrong with that. That's not defaming. It doesn't disqualify him largely shouldn't change how we see him as a person other than that it might have affected his politic. That's, that's it. And that's why that's important. And that's something that's missing from this book. So without further ado. Can you see my setup? I have not one, but two different notebooks to talk about this, okay? Okay? Learned. I read it twice. Let's get into it. Who wrote it? For what purpose? For what audience? And what's missing? We already covered number four. What's missing? Who wrote it? What purpose? What audience? Okay. A man of many names over the course of his life, but for the purposes of this video, we're going to call him Malcolm X or X, was a civil rights leader, uh, primarily active in the 50s and 60s in the United States of America. He's a United States citizen that converted into Nation of Islam at first as a minister, like a very prominent figure in the Nation of Islam movement in the United States, and then later converted to a more traditional Islamic faith at the later end of his life. Uh, the purpose for writing this book was that he was asked to essentially. I don't believe that he had any inclinations to write it himself. So he really did it because he was asked. And I assume, even though he doesn't like say so anywhere, I wrote this book because I think that we can assume it's because he felt his life was worth documenting and he felt it would be helpful for people to know about who he was and where he came from. By the time he was writing this book, he was a world renowned figure and he was really adamant about making sure to not take any of that money at first. All of it was going to the Nation of Islam and then later when he splits from the Nation of Islam, he directs that coin to his wife and his children. For what audience? The audience is us, the people, both the people of the time and obviously the generations to come. The audience is you, me, the general public. 
And then we have to circle back to the who because we do have a quick note on the authorship. This does say the autobiography of Malcolm X as told by Alex Haley. Now, Alex Haley was a prominent journalist and reporter at the time. He goes on to write several huge, huge books. One of them being Roots, question mark? Yeah, he wrote Roots. This is that guy. So there can be questions of, well, how much did Malcolm really write? Uh, how much can we attribute really to the theology, the mindset, the word of Malcolm X? How true to source is this? From what we understand about the book, there's no real reason to think that Alex Haley took liberties. Like the process of them writing this book was hours and hours and hours of interviewing, Alex Haley taking quotes from his interviews um, and interpreting them into like a narrative format, sending it back to Malcolm for edits. Malcolm would edit it, send it back, and then go like that back and forth until they were both satisfied. They also reviewed the book after the big split from um, Nation of Islam. And X really had to grapple with exactly how much um, praise he wanted to leave in from Mr. Muhammad. Like they wrote this book over the course of years. So there's no real reason to think that Malcolm X would not stand by the stuff that is in his autobiography. His autobiography. If anything, we should be skeptical because this is this man's autobiography. He is representing himself, meaning that he is going to shape his story a certain way. He might leave out things that he thinks are too private or too scandalizing or maybe chewing on ideas that he's not ready to share in the public yet. Because his gender analysis is trash. I'm gonna tell you right now, you already know, you, you, you likely already know how I feel about this. His gender analysis is just not good. And I don't, I, I, I'll spoil it now, I don't know. I don't know if he gets to a point where I would have considered him and I comrades in the exact same fight. Solidarity, yes. Comrades, I don't know, and we can get there. But I want to leave space for the amount that he did not get to say because this is his autobiography. He's only telling us what he's comfortable with. If he reached a point where he was gender critical of himself for any reason, it probably would not have made it into this rendition. I just, again, that might also be something that is missing here, okay? And I don't want to necessarily attribute that to malice or apathy. We don't know. Chapters 1 and 2 are really the chapters that uh, focus on his childhood. Now, because he doesn't say this, but it's relevant context, Malcolm X, born Malcolm Little, was number four of eight children in his family, born in Omaha, Nebraska, in 1925. He does talk about his dad being a Garvian, someone who really studied and embodied the works of Marcus Garvey. He was a Stan. He was also a Baptist priest. His mother was a stay-at-home mother who spent a lot of time pregnant and nursing children. And Malcolm X describes her as someone that works a lot. Like he says, when he recalls her, he remembers her like over the stove. His dad was also a race man, um, someone who championed for the black race, who promoted organizing amongst the local black people, particularly from the pulpit. Um, and he died violently as is the fate of most race men. Uh, from what we're understanding, his brothers also died violently. Uh, Malcolm X, knew from a pretty young age that he would also probably die violently rather than of natural causes. Uh, and worse, it was a uh, died violently that was ruled as an accident. Let's get uh, into some analysis here. Some might say, well, how do you have a race consciousness as a child? Most black children do. The condition of being black is political. You start thinking about politics really early, even if you wouldn't call it politics. He's reminiscing um, or recounting his childhood. So lots of this is his voice now, but seeing it through the eyes of his childhood self, right? He says he doesn't respect religious people a lot, which is funny because of how religious he becomes over the course of his life. Um, and he also has pretty scathing class analysis from jump. He just like thinks that middle-class black people are complacent and misguided. He says the so-called middle-class Negroes, the typical status symbol, integration-seeking type of Negroes. He's like, why would you do that? You're getting pennies. Like, not only do they not want you, you're getting pennies. This is him as, like, as a child. And he really, this is a politic that is consistent over the course of this book. Malcolm X don't ever like rich, but he does not rock with rich black folks. He doesn't. So, side note, it is sort of weird seeing, uh, like Malcolm X politics being adorned by super wealthy black people, but that's an entirely different video essay, entirely different. He's also witnessing domestic violence in his household. Um, he talks about how his dad regularly had to defend his family with guns, so he did grow up around firearms. He also says that his memories are of the friction between his mother and father. They seem to be always at odds. Sometimes my father would beat her. It might have had something to do with the fact that my mother had a pretty good education. 
Where she got it, I don't know, but as an educated woman, I suppose, can't resist the temptation to correct an uneducated man. Every now and then, when she would put those smooth words on him, he would grab her. The phrasing here, and this is why we do close reads, the phrasing here, it says, sometimes my father would beat her and it might have had something to do with the fact that my mother had a good education. Not that his father had anger management issues or not that he was abusive, but the fact that his mother just couldn't resist correcting him. So of course he beat her. That's rough. That's, that's a rough start. I'm going to be honest. He also later says that he's really proud of himself for never hitting his mom. And it's rough, okay? The beginning also shows us a really good example of the failed promise of patriarchy. And for this, we need to define some terms, patriarchy and privilege. Now, you might be saying, Ismatsu, I've heard those words before. I know what they mean. I believe you, you're a smart cookie. I just wanna make sure that all of us are on the same page. So patriarchy is the social, political, and economic system where power is transferred from man to man, usually throughout generations. And privilege, is when the system that is designed was either designed for me in mind or not designed to hurt me, okay? So these two relate to one another because this, in this book, is a patriarchal society. That is what Malcolm X is navigating through. That's the world that he grew up in. That's how he is socialized. We, right now, are a patriarchal society. This is the world that we are growing up in. This is how we are socialized. These definitions are important because we need to understand what we're analyzing here. Notes on patriarchy, it usually works through family systems. Um, this is the, we can see this in the rise of the nuclear family where there is a head of household who is the father. There is the helper of the household who is the mother under the jurisdiction of the father. And there are children, future heirs, and they are being raised as future heirs or they are being raised as helpers to future heirs. Women are not really supposed to handle power directly. They're all supposed to wield and yield it from the power, the economic, the social, and the political power that comes from the men around them. That's usually either your father, your uncles, your maybe older cousins, your brothers, or your betrothed, if you are a woman. It means that women are always under the stewardship of men. The promise of patriarchy, the reason that this is supposed to be a good or a compelling idea, is because you're supposed to find a good leader, find a good man, and then they will be able to produce social capital, economic capital, and political capital with which to provide for the people that are dependent on that man and protect them from any harm doing, okay? When that promise is broken, it results in violence. When that promise is broken, it results in violence and it can be broken for a number of reasons, not just because the patriarch changes his mind, not just because the patriarch can decide to be abusive at any point in time or to flex control in a way that does not protect uh, his constituents, even though that does happen. And we see that happening right now with Malcolm X's mom and dad. There's also death. Death can upset the promises of patriarchy because when that patriarch is gone, that woman and those children do not have access to social, economic, or political capital. That's important because that's about to happen. That's about to happen to the littles and it breaks them up. Privilege under this system means that the system that is created here is designed to work for me in mind or it was not designed to hurt me in particular. Privilege is always systematic. Privilege is a symptom of systems, things that go on way above our heads. Uh, things that were created likely before we were born and we inherit them, perpetuate them, and die. That's a system. It's bigger than good things happen to you. It's bigger than individual benefit. The system itself was designed for me in mind. Malcolm X is the designed recipient for patriarchy, right? He is a young, cis, black man who is able-bodied and able to produce capital. He is supposed to participate in patriarchy and it's supposed to benefit him so long as the promises of patriarchy are kept. Malcolm X's mother, this system was not designed for her benefit, right? It's designed for male benefit because patriarchy is period, it's pretty parasitic and I don't wanna say that patriarchy wasn't designed to hurt women because in some ways it was. I think in some ways it was. However, women under this system that have enough access to like beauty um, and other forms of beauty, fertility, housework, other things that could be useful to their patriarchs have a system that isn't designed to hurt them specifically. It might hurt them, but it isn't designed to. Now, patriarchy is designed to hurt people that do not fit in the nuclear family model for whatever reason. Are you 
queer? Do you not have consistent access to beauty? Are you disabled? Do you regularly dissent? Do you question authority? Those big things will get you punished by the promise of patriarchy being broken in your face and usually that results in violence. Here it resulted in violence because his mother was expressing dissent. She was correcting her husband and so the promise of patriarchy, I will protect you, broken and she got hit. This is important in context because your politics starts to develop when you are little. You're observing the rules around you and you're internalizing them. That is a politic even if we don't call it that or think that that's too fancy. That is what that is. He's developing a gender politic very early and his gender politic comes from a patriarchal house where it is okay to hit women if they disrespect you. And I do have to point out that uh, this woman had eight kids and it seems that they were one after another after another. If the rest of Malcolm X's uh, brothers and sisters are not far along behind him, they're all about a year, a year and some change apart. So it's likely, well, it means that it is most certainly a reality that uh, Malcolm X's mom was also being hit while she was pregnant or nursing. Uh, his father dies. His father is killed violently by a mob of white men because he continues to organize and rally the other black people around him. Um, and it's, it's obvious that he dies violently. The life insurance decides to rule it as an accident so that they don't have to pay Malcolm X's mom out. Uh, so they, his dad was really big about getting life insurance policies, probably because he knew he was going to die violently, but, and it was going to be a way for him to continue to provide for his family, even if he was not physically there to provide for him, because his dad do, did do a lot of providing. It says he built a house, he built them a house with his hands. Like, that is a provider. <laughs> when he died, he wanted to make sure his family was still provided for it, and the insurance companies who are racist, the insurance companies who are white patriarchs who have significantly more power than a black patriarch under this system ever could said actually we're not gonna give you that money i know that that man basically got sawed in half but looks like an accident to us so now we are dealing with the broken promise of patriarchy the littles become destitute because the person that their mother entrusted her life and her children's life with has died the insurance company said screw you she's can't work uh, because she's black every time that an employer finds out that she's black she gets fired she weeps openly in front of her children the great depression hits they're starving the welfare people are coming to pick off her children like buzzards they're circling around the house malcolm x does not make this particularly easy on his mom he's out here stealing he knows that it's wrong he does it anyways the welfare people start to create psychological violence which is something that social workers are prone to do i should know i just graduated from social work school this is also violent systemic violence can come in many forms it doesn't just have to look like physical brutality which is what's happening to his father it's looking like systemic authority which is what's happening to his mother the fact that she cannot work has to be kept on welfare yet is punished for being on welfare that is structural violence and it's a particular kind of misogynistic structural violence the people that endure this kind of of psychological weight and torture at the hands of the state for engaging in welfare which is supposed to be available to widowed moms are black and indigenous women really women of color but particularly black and indigenous women i really hesitate to say that she goes crazy because what else is patriarchy not particularly fond of? Disability. And the state slaps the label of insane on that woman so fast and they institutionalize her and then they take her children. They take Malcolm, she has a breakdown. And then they're like, this woman is crazy. Also because she's refusing pig. That woman don't feed her kids pork. And But black people, poor people, black poor people, especially single moms aren't allowed to be picky. Beggars can't be choosers. So she stuck down on her politics, refused a food that she refused to eat because she didn't want to feed her family that. And they said, you're insane. She had a breakdown from supporting eight children by herself. And they called her insane. There's briefly a time where she's being courted by a man um, and she has to perform desirability. Uh, the text talks about that she was like all, you know, pleasant and hair twirly and they haven't seen her like that in some time. It's not because this woman has shit to be happy about. She's not happy, but she knows that she has to convince a man that she's worth betting his assets on. And ultimately he ups and leaves her because he's like, I don't want eight children. So she snaps under the weight of these children, under the weight of having to make sure that she survives along with eight other mouths. It says that she has a breakdown and then she gets institutionalized. Do you see how fast the state will move to slap the label of insane on you? 
of clinically insane on you, of disabled, <laughs> unable to support themselves, insane on you, and then they stuck her in an institution. And she was there for like a couple decades before her family was able to organize to get her out. Those are the stakes. That, that's the dice you roll when you decide to play the beauty for capital gain. Because it's not like she had a choice, right? This is of an era where women don't have a lot of choices, particularly not black women. She was a light-skinned black woman. She said, let me get myself a man that will provide for me. That's neither, that's not shade. However, this is why I caution us against this game. It's a very dangerous game to play. That's pretty much it for his early childhood. After that, he gets relocated into a boys' home run by white folks. He does exceptionally there. He starts to fit in. Um, he has some sense of stability. He's a child. He was six when his dad died. Um, so now he's in a boys' home. They put him in middle school. He's doing great in middle school, smart as a whip. Like he's, he is really engaging in school in a way that impresses everybody. He's the only black kid. And he realizes that he's much more of a mascot to them than a real person. I believe on 20, page 28, he says he can be with them, but he's never going to be considered of them. Even though they appeared to have the door opened, it was still closed. Thus, they never really did see me. This is a politic. This is his politics developing over time. He's like in seventh and eighth grade at this point in time and going, oh, integration is useless because they'll never actually see you. They never actually want you to be a part of their spaces. The reason that he gets kicked out of this um, home, the reason he gets asked to leave and it's really just because he stops dropping his eyes when they say the N word around him. When they make fun of black people or when they call black people dumb or stupid, he doesn't look away he makes it known that that is bad and uncomfortable and that he can hear, like, I, I can hear you. That's all he does. People start asking him, what's wrong? He's like, nothing's wrong, nothing changed, but he just, he stopped mutely pretending to be okay with it. What doesn't white patriarchy like? Dissent. Black patriarchy don't like it either, but this is dissent for white patriarchs in a white patriarchal society. Don't dissent. So they ask him to leave and in a stroke of divine timing, luck, prayers from whoever his grandma was. His half-sister shows up, his half-sister who's significantly older than him, and says, Malcolm can come stay with me. And Ella is the first Black woman that Malcolm X meets that's really proud of her Blackness. And I also think that that is transformative for him. So he moves to Boston with Ella, and this is where he spends the next part of his childhood. I call him an adolescent. We're talking like 14, 15, by 16, I'm pretty sure he's in Harlem. Uh, but he spends the next couple years of his life here and Ella is also, I would call them Jack and Jill Blacks, sorry, uh, like well-to-do or aspiringly well-to-do that also wants Malcolm X to go on the, listen, be a, in the solid petite bourgeoisie, um, be a part of the middle class, you're smart, apply yourself, live a good life, maybe you could even become a carpenter. And Malcolm X is looking at that like, first of all, you people are waiters. You say you work in banking, but you're actually the janitor of the bank. You're not doing anything impressive. You're accepting pennies from white people. And then you're so proud and smug about it and acting better than all the ghetto black people in the ghettos. And that's trash. And he's also looking around and seeing that the black people that have any real money to play with are in illicit trade. And it doesn't mean that they're not smart. In fact, those people are smart as whips who have to evade the police and run their businesses. And he's looking at that like, what is that over there? That looks very interesting to me. His older sister Ella is like, please do not. But he's like, mm, I'm gonna just go see. She's really trying to discourage him from getting a job. He's like, ah, I'm just gonna sign. She's just gonna shine some shoes. I've been here for a little bit. I want some pocket money. Let me go shine shoes. This is where he meets Shorty. Well, I mean, he meets Shorty in like a different area of the book, but Shorty really becomes like a surrogate mentor. He has a lot of surrogate mentors over the course of his life. As a ward of the state, and he's also orphan. Like his mother is still alive, but she's locked in a mental asylum and his father is dead. And both of those things happened when he was a child. So there are a lot of places in this book that he turns to for for like guidance and Shorty is the first, I think. Basically, he, start, he starts shoe shining with Shorty. He starts drinking, he starts smoking, he starts dice rolling, he's taking part in it. He's like, I'm with all the shits. Give me all the shits. He's shining shoes, okay? He's out here keeping watch of the customers inside. He's getting proficient. Freddie is teaching him how to shine shoes, but like how to shine shoes, you know what I mean? Slipping people illicit trade, uh, directing people to sex workers. He's saying you can make 10, $12 a dance for yourself if you work everything right. Freddie, who was the person teaching him how to shine shoes is, uh, before I got out of the car in front of Ella's, 
the main thing you got to remember is that everything in this world is a hustle so long red i feel like he really internalizes those words because that's really like the thesis of the next chapter of his life he gets into it zoot suits dances perms then called conk he meets laura eventually shoe shiny gets a little hot or ella doesn't want him to do it anymore um so he starts working at this like pharmacy this girl starts to come in and her name is laura and he's sitting here like i don't know laura kind of cute they get to talking he finds out that she is really studious in fact laura and him feel like foils to me because malcolm x was just this person he was just in he was just in middle school in white centric all white spaces doing excellent like being praised for his academic prowess and laura's the same way um she's really encouraging him to read again she's like you like reading you should start reading again and he's like ah oh, i don't know because he's big and bad in the street now or whatever and too good for education she's thinking about going to college he's like good for you college isn't for me you know they're talking they're talking they're talking he's telling her about the dances that he goes to the zoot suits that he wears that he bought on credit and he's tall as fuck he's like 15 i think like she's older than him by a year but she doesn't think that she thinks that he's older than her because he gets tall really early laura's like i want to go with you to a dance at first she lies to her grandmother to go but then they go together listen it is so much dance chemistry they go to two the first time they dance together but they don't compete at the end uh when they lindy hop the second time they do when they do compete and they blow everybody away they're scooting they're jiving they're jazzing listen the band is i can see this in my mind's eye he's so prolific i can see it in my mind's eye the way she twirls around him she's he's describing her as light as a feather they have an insane amount of dance chemistry i don't know if you've ever caught a partner on the dance floor whatever kind of dancing you do and found an insane amount of chemistry with someone it is palpable and then what happens after that? He leaves her ass standing there for a white girl that he caught the eye of while he was dancing with Laura. He leaves her then and there, goes to talk up this white girl, makes plans to meet up with her after he drops Laura off, he drops her off. And then she never comes, obviously. She never comes to the, to, to the pharmacy again to see him because he left her there for a white girl, ugly. He just profusely apologized for this, but this is um, one of the two close readings that we're gonna do for like the youth section. Laura never again came to the drugstore as long as I continued to work there. The next time I saw her, she was a wreck of a woman, notorious around Black Roxbury, in and out of jail. She had finished high school, but by then she was already going the wrong way. Defying her grandmother, she had started going out late and drinking liquor. This led to dope, and that led to selling herself to men. Learning to hate the men who bought her, she also became a lesbian. One of the shames I have carried for years is that I blame myself for all of this. To treat her as I did for a white woman made the blow double heavy. The only excuse I can offer is that, like so many of my black brothers today, I was just deaf, dumb, and blind. Ugh. This really- I have never encountered more tank crinkling analysis than this. This is some bullshit. So, to spoil the rest of the book, not the rest of the book for you, but his next chapter in life, his next chapter of early adult life, uh, has dope in it he starts doping up he's robbing people at gunpoint he's engaging in burglary he's pulling guns on people that shoot like that cheat him in cars okay he also again leaves out the queer sex work here but other sources say that that was something that he might have been partaking in so he ends up on this exact same beat and he was here in the first place because he looked around and said, you know what, academics is cool, Sch school is cool and whatever, but the real money is in illicit trade. What illicit trades were available to Laura at that time? Yeah, maybe you were the gateway, but it is also possible, just as we could read her as a wayward prostitute, we could read her as someone that lost her way, a good Christian girl that was gonna go to college, then lost her way and then sold herself to men and became a lesbian. Or she came to the same conclusions that you came to, looked around her and said, you know what? I actually, school is cool, but I want to make money money. And access to money money for a black woman at the time was sex work. The sex work life is full of illicit shit, like drugs. The same drugs you were taking later. It flattens Laura into like a secondary character whose whole life was spun out of control by the move of Malcolm's hand rather than someone who made all of her own decisions. And she made similar decisions to you. We understand why Malcolm X goes the way of the illicit trade. It's obvious, it makes sense. But when she does it, she's lost. When she does it, she's a wayward prostitute. And also like engaging in sex work does not make you gay. If that's true for Malcolm X, it's also true of Laura. 
the gender analysis gets worse and this is going to get worse from here i'm going to use the term misogyny because that is what this is the idea is present in the rest of this text especially as it presents to women are structural those are learned patriarchal behaviors i remember when books hook said that learned patriarchal behaviors the words for when you have distaste of women that comes structurally is misogyny okay that's what that's called i'm not going to shy away from it i'm not going to dress it up and call it something different i'm not going to call it problematic i'm not going to call it uncomfortable or unsavory it is all of those things it's misogyny that's what that's called that's what i will call it dressing those words up in euphemisms like problematic shy away from the problem i should be able to say malcolm x had some issues with misogyny because that is a true documented evidenced statement that's a full and complete sentence and i do not think that that requires me to espouse every good thing about him while he also call out his misogyny he was misogynist hey while you chew on this fish there are bones in it same sentence look out for the bones in this fish be careful not to swallow it on your way down this is why we talk about this stuff by the way Please don't use the word prostitute as a stand-in for the word sex worker. They have really different connotations. Uh, sex worker is the most neutral way to say someone who engages in sex for money or goods or sex acts for money and goods. These are his words, so I will read them as they are. But in general, please know that shy away from using that word about real people in real life. Malcolm X's views on sex work also kind of suck. Um, and again, this is something that I would be a lot harder on him for if I didn't know that he has an alleged past of sex work, of queer sex work. Like, knowing that makes passages where he talks about the moral depravity really different because now I'm wondering, well, is that how you felt? Is that how extreme it felt for you? Were those your circumstances? Are you feeling guilty because you did enjoy it? We don't know. Oh, that's an entirely, uh, there is a whole essay. There is a whole essay in how we only view sex work as fine and appropriate so long as it's your last choice and otherwise you would never and not because you enjoy it or in any capacity you're not allowed to enjoy it either you're a happy doped up hooker or you are a wayward prostitute those are the tropes um but he still finds a really interesting way to blame women in the moral depravity question and he learned lots of stories from his sex worker friends of course exclusively in an observational space we know he was there as an observer he says that he got into his home life of evil he saw the white man's moral with his own eyes he was younger he was working in the bar he says he probably touched on their kid brother instincts or something like that he said they would slip into his room and they would smoke reefers and they would talk and it was always after the morning rush malcolm's like what's the morning rush uh it was the husbands it was the husbands who would leave their houses in time to stop by saint nicholas avenue before they went to work so that they could engage a sex worker for pay um and it, it included white men who came up all the way from downtown on their way to work and then he says domineering complaining demanding wives who were just about psychologically castrated their husbands were responsible for the early rush not husbands who decided to see sex workers while being married it was the wives' fault for driving them there. These wives were so disagreeable and made their men so tense that they were robbed of the satisfaction of being men. To escape this tension and the chance of being ridiculed by his own wife, each of these men had gotten up early and come to a prostitute. The prostitutes had to make it their business to be students of men. They said after most men passed their viral 20s, they went to bed mainly to satisfy their egos. And because a lot of women don't understand it that way, they damage and wreck a man's ego because it's the women's fault for wrecking their egos and not treating their poor sexual performance kindly. No matter how little virality a man has to offer, prostitutes make him feel for a time he's the greatest man in the world. Yes, that's what they're paid to do. That's their job. That's why these prostitutes had that morning rush of business. More wives could keep their husbands if they realize their greatest urge is to be men. I want to vomit. Like, like, there is no critical thought there other than how do we make men stepping out on their wives to engage sex workers women's fault. When women step out on their husbands, it is very much their fault. When men step out on their wives, it's because the wife drove him out. He, she was so domineering. She complained so much. She demanded so much of him that he had no choice but to take a cab downtown all the way, all the way from downtown 
to come engage a sex worker before work. That's their fault. That is misogyny. There is no reason why when women cheat, it's their fault. And when men cheat, it's also women's fault. Ready? I'm gonna say it again, say it with me. That is misogyny. That is just misogyny. The rest of his time as a hustler, everything before prison is pretty episodic. Um, a general gist is that he is doing what he needs to do to get by, um, to feed his drug addiction that he picks up while starting to rob people. He says he starts to do dope to cope with the fact that he was robbing people at gunpoint. He has a best friend slash partner in crime, Sammy, also known as Sammy the Pimp. <laughs> Pimp, name, slick. <laughs> he gets himself into gambling. He ends up like getting into a disagree, a long-term disagreement with another hustler, an older hustler on the block called West Indian Archie. And they get into it so badly that Malcolm has to leave town because West, uh, West Indian Archie is like, give me my money or I'm going to kill you. And it's like a whole... It's a whole big thing. There is a point in time where him and his partner Sammy go for uh, like a really difficult job and they barely make it out. Now, this is something that I referred to on TikTok. I already talked about it on TikTok. So I am going to do the closest reading imaginable because people really tried me in that comment, trying to say that I was misrepresenting the situation or that this situation was a case of self-defense. I just do not believe that's what the text says. So we're gonna look at it together. Close. To set the stage, once again, Malcolm X is fully into a life of robbery. Sammy and I are on a robbery job. They get a bad scare. They have a very close call. Things are getting tight in Harlem. He's saying people are getting forced to work. Pimping was poor. Sammy went, Sammy went on the job with him. They selected one of those situations that they called an impossible job, but where people think that the guards are really lazy because they think no one's gonna rob them. So Sammy and Malcolm X go in to rob them. In the middle of the act, he said they had some bad luck. A bullet gray scammy. We just barely escaped. This is where I'm just gonna start to read. Sammy fortunately wasn't really hurt. We split up, which was always wise to do. Just before daybreak, I went to Sammy's apartment. His newest woman, one of those beautiful but hot-headed Spanish Negroes, was in there crying and carrying on over Sammy. She went for me, screaming and clawing. She knew I'd been in on it with him. I fended her off. Not being able to figure out why Sammy didn't shut her up, I did. And from the corner of my eye, I saw Sammy going for his gun. Sammy's reaction that way to my hitting his woman, close as he and I were, was the only weak spot I'd ever glimpsed. The woman screamed and dove for him. She knew as I did, when your best friend draws a gun on you, he usually has lost all control of his emotions and he intends to shoot. She distracted Sammy long enough for me to bolt through the door. Sammy chased me about a block. We soon made up on the surface, but things are never fully right again with anyone you've seen trying to kill you. That's the full text, okay? That's, that's the full bit. I read all the context. Let's really give this a look, okay? Because people try to claim this is self-defense. That's just not what this says. Sammy was almost killed on a robbery job with Malcolm that he normally doesn't do, but pimping is bad. That's all we know. We don't know whose fault it is. We don't know what happens. But it does go wrong and Sammy is not usually on robbery jobs and Sammy is the one that almost gets killed. A bullet grazes Sammy. That is his life, that's his life flash before his eyes, okay? They go home and Sammy's new girlfriend, a beautiful but hot-headed Spanish Negro, is in there crying and carrying around about Sammy as if that's like an unreasonable reaction to your partner almost being killed because that's what happened. She went for Malcolm, whom she probably considers responsible for Sammy's near-death experience, screaming and clawing because she knew I'd been in on it with him. Now let's watch. I fended her off, period. Complete sentence. New sentence. Not being able to figure out why Sammy didn't shut her up, I did. That doesn't say to me, she came at me and then I hit her. He says, she came at me, I fended her off. And I'm looking around wondering why someone didn't shut this bitch up. So I shut her up. That sounds like self-defense to you? Not being able to figure out why Sammy didn't shut her up, I did? That sounds like self-defense? I don't think that's what Malcolm X is arguing here. I think you are laying yourself prostate for an argument that this man isn't making. And as we get further into the book, there's a huge theme of idolization that comes out. Uh, Malcolm X ends up being really hurt and ostracized and ultimately violently harmed by someone who he used to idolize. 
And because he idolized him, he was unable to critique that man for a really long time. I would think that Malcolm X warns us against this. To argue that this is self-defense is to idolize Malcolm X. He didn't say that. He said he hit her to shut her up. That is worthy of critique. Critique, by the way, I should be able to make without having to espouse every good thing that Malcolm X has ever done. I'm not tarnishing his legacy by reading his words from his book. And also, we know about him. We know what he did. If I say, hey, there are bones in that fish. One of those bones is misogyny. He had a history of violence with women. Those are all full, complete, evidenced statements. He would admit to that too. If you try and tell me that this was self-defense, what you don't want to hear is critiques of Malcolm X. That's it. That's your issue. Your issue is with the fact that I'm critiquing his past violence. Just like this past violence against women, ideologically and physically, isn't good, but he does good things later, and this bad stuff does not discount the good stuff, the equal and opposite is also true. The good stuff he does later does not discount the bad stuff that he did. You can't unsmack somebody. You can't do that. And this woman probably has a life outside of this, you know. She might have lived long enough to turn on the TV and watch Malcolm say the most disrespected person in America is a black woman and say, that's the nigga that hit me across the face. And after he hit me across the face to shut me up, I defended his life. She turns around and says, Sammy, don't shoot. I will tell you right now, she's better than me. <laughs> she turned around for everybody said this was out of context. Here's the full context. The black woman he just smacked across the face turned around and made sure that he got out of that with his life because Sammy was going to shoot. And there was not a question, I don't think in Sammy's mind, in Malcolm X's mind, or in the hot-headed Spanish Negro's mind that Sammy was about to shoot. Don't tell me that was self-defense because it wasn't. To do so idolizes Malcolm X and that is dangerous. It is dangerous because you will miss the bones when you are taking in all his good stuff, all his good critique, all the meat on this shit. You will also swallow those ugly, harmful bones. And that will lead to you becoming to a place where that woman says, yeah, that man smacked me. And then your first response is, well, he does a lot of great things. Who is that protecting? Malcolm X, the world famous man with an already established legacy? Or the person that was actually harmed in this situation? We still do this today in leftist spaces. There are leftist men that have a history of or an ongoing act of violence. And then when women or people that are not men try to say something, try to call them on that, it's, well, he does a lot of good work. Okay, he also hits someone. The equal and opposite is true. These are critiques worth making. And I should not have to espouse every good thing that Malcolm X has ever done to acknowledge the bad shit that he's done. I don't think he argues that either. But when you lay yourself out to claim self-defense where there wasn't any, where I don't think he's even claiming this was self-defense, you are idolizing a figure that specifically asked not to be idolized. That is dangerous. You will miss the bones. Do you know how frustrating it is to finally find your light and angle on what is literally the last segment of this video? Oh Lord. Hello, this is your editor here. You might be saying, uh, it's not too, this is quite an abrupt ending. We're only like, you know, 35% of the way through the book. Where's the rest of this? It's on my computer, which is coughing. Trying to render all of this media has given my MacBook asthma. Part two is already filmed and edited. It just has to render. So see you in a few days. Let me get you niggas hip to this tea god pimping. There's some vital information, so I need y'all to listen. It's real simple. Pay attention. Do this shit with intention. Because I'll smack your silly ass if you're still sipping on lifting. Now let's get it. First, we're going to start off. Listen, do not crucify me here, but I put a little French lavender in with my pistachio. Look how pretty that is. You're telling me you don't like a nutty floral? It was the right decision. It was the right decision.